Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I wasn't actually here last year uh, with, uh, with, with VMware at this particular, with, uh, you know, with Trend at this particular event. Uh, I was at a few of the other Australia event, Australian events, and the focus of what I talked about last year was a little bit different uh, to the focus of today's presentation. Last year, we were very much emphasizing the shift that companies were making towards cloud computing and this overall move to consumerization. Uh, this year, uh, what I'll be talking about a lot more is the implications of these shifts, the ramifications of these shifts. And when we uh, present on the topic of security, we tend to you know, come up with a lot of scare stories and a lot of reasons why security is so important. People, I guess, typically view security as a form of insurance to deal with a lot of the decisions that they've made. However, I think this is starting to change. Uh, organizations are starting to realize that it's critical to have an appropriate security posture that gives you the agility that you need to handle things like the move to cloud computing and the move to consumerization. So people are starting to consider it together with their overall stance rather than saying, OK, let's shift more and more of our resources into the cloud. Let's have BYOD and then security as a follow on. So today, uh, what I'll start talking about reflects to a certain extent what we touched on last year, which is the coming together of cloud and mobility. I think it's pretty much a given now that organizations are looking to put more and more of their IT resources into the cloud, and moreover, the public cloud where they can do this. Uh, more and more organizations are looking at BYOD uh, and how they can do this. So what I'll talk about is the broad implications of this. And something else that's very important that needs to be considered is how IT itself is becoming more and more embedded in key processes within industries. We've moved to a, away from a situation uh, where the focus was very much on increasing productivity and automating as much as we can to one where IT is moving into the DNA of the way businesses operate and transforming the way they do things. And just to give you some examples, uh, you know, the, the, the way cars are starting to evolve. So more and more smart technology has been built into automotives, and I'll talk a bit more about this later. The music industry has been completely turned upside down by cloud technology and other forms of technology been embedded into that particular industry. Smart grids are partial smart grids. Bits of smart grids are starting to appear in the utilities industry. So basically, there are more and more IP-enabled devices spread around different industries, often described as the Internet of Things. So this really creates a much wider platform for malware and for security threats to hit. So security needs to be considered much more broadly than just within a kind of narrow IT environment that it's been considered uh, in the past. Because just think, if we start considering the implications, we've seen examples of security, uh, you know, the, the impact of security breaches on power networks, on, let's say, automotives, on a variety of different kinds of industries. The impact is much more profound than it would have been in the past. And we've seen examples of how malware has been used to have a, a big, big impact on, for example, the Iranian nuclear program. So that just gives us an idea of the potential impact uh, of malware uh, on, the, on, on, the, on the physical world. I'll then talk a bit about IT security market evolution. So as an analyst, we're always it's assumed to, pro to provide numbers and data and what's happening in a particular industry. So I'll talk about the different elements of the security industry and how they're growing. And then I'll talk in a bit more detail about social media and consumerization, which again are opening us up to a wide variety of new threats. And then very specifically around cloud and mobile threats with partic particular reference to the fast growing threat around the Android ecosystem in the mobile world. 
So just to start to talk about where we've come from and where we're at. So with computing, when we started you know, using IT in organizations in the 60s and 70s, it was really used for back office activities and it was trained specialists in white coats, computer scientists effectively, who interacted with IT. Over time, technology became, let's say, more democratized and we moved into the distributed PC world sometime in the 80s, so the mid to late 80s, this became commonplace. So PCs were on the desks of most white collar workers, at least by the early 1990s, and that form of computing became pretty much the standard. We're still kind of in that model, we're moving away from it, but we're still effectively in that distributed, distributed model. But we started seeing a gradual move to more portable computing, let's say, where people uh, were using laptops more widely, and what we've come to just in the last few years is people using mobile devices, tablets and smartphones for accessing more and more of their resources, both from a personal perspective and from the professional perspective. And also for engaging uh, with uh, large companies, so engaging with their banks, their airlines and so on. And this is just opening us up to a lot more uh, threats, a lot more potential security threats that we need to start focusing on now. So as we move further and further into this world, we need to rethink our entire security posture to address this mobile and smart device world that we're moving into. So again, just to give some data to back everything up, it's not really just a, you know, a perception that mobility is taking over. In 2012, the internet was accessed to a greater extent from mobile devices than from traditional PCs. So it's over a year ago that we've made this shift. Now most security decisions are still centered around Windows and PC environments. We need to a much greater extent focus on mobile devices and this new cloud world that we are partially into already. And again, just to, to reinforce the point I made earlier about IP technology being embedded in more and more types of activities that we do. So, you know, not too long ago, you know, we were really, when we looked at the networks we were using, the networks were really all about fairly basic, prosaic kinds of activities such as emails and internet browsing. Then after that, social networking, file sharing, Real-time communications became mainstream, but as our network starts speeding up, cloud computing is really becoming a reality. There are fewer and fewer business reasons for not going there. I mean, obviously security is still perceived as one of the major challenges, but there are ways of addressing security issues associated with cloud. But what these faster networks, together with cloud computing, are bringing along are things like telemedicine, things like connected cars, teleeducation, smart grids, M2M, this broader internet of things that we talk about, which really is opening us up to all manner of threats, many of which we've seen already occurring. So we've seen attempts from North Korea and South Korea to impact the infrastructure there. Attempts on North Korea as well uh, from South Korea and other places to do this. We've seen you know, famous cases like the attacks on the Iranian nuclear facilities that I mentioned earlier too. So it's becoming much, much broader and the impact is becoming a lot more profound. So just an example. I know to many this might, so might sound like science fiction, but self-driving cars are actually starting to become a reality. You know, Google has worked with General Motors to develop the world's first self-driving car, and Nevada, the state of Nevada, has passed laws in the US to allow driverless cars on its highways. Now, it's not that all of a sudden we're going to move from the kind of cars we have today to completely driverless cars with no people in them. Bit by bit, more functionality will be built into the cars that you drive that do things like control the distance that your car is from the car in front of it, that do things like prevent your car from going over the speed limit, that do things like prevent your car from going through a red light, that give you a kind of overdrive facility that can allow you to sit and work in your PC while your car uh, controls itself. So a kind of cruise control, but in built-up areas. 
So this is actually starting to happen bit by bit. Over time, insurance companies will insist on this. Insurance companies may determine your premiums on the amount of this automation that is built into your car. Governments might eventually start legislating around it, saying cars are not allowed on the road if they don't have this type of functionality built in. This is starting to happen. It won't be long, we expect, before people say, isn't it amazing that only 10 or 20 years ago, cars were driven by people alone with no automated overdrive facilities to prevent accidents, to stop people from going through red lights and so forth. And a lot of this has been legislated for. So for example, in Europe, e-core facilities are already been built into new cars, which means if there's an accident, instantly a message goes out uh, to the emergency uh, authorities uh, so they can get there fast. But what are the implications of this? What are the security implications of this? So these need to be considered. Again, we have IP technology sitting in these cars that are increasingly automated. What are the security implications? And this is just one example of where technology is taking us in terms of converging with industries and transforming the way different types of industries actually operate. So just to my kind of earlier point that I'd like to emphasize, Virtual world security issues are starting to massively impact the physical world. So if we go back to the 80s or 90s, when we had viruses and so on, it might bring down an IT system and sure it would be a massive inconvenience, it might slow down certain types of activities. But today, the effect can be very profound just from very simple security breaches. I mean, for example, somebody hacked into the Associated Press Twitter account, I'm sure many of you here are familiar with this particular incident and sent out a tweet saying that two explosions in the White there were two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured, which had an instant impact on stock markets. So that very simple security breach had an enormous impact on the physical world. And this is just a simple, rather uncomplicated one. So South Korea, for example, the big issue there that they're paranoid about is this, the nuclear security plants because the North Koreans have got teams of people constantly looking at ways they can target attacks on very specific facilities in that country. So it's massively impacting the physical world and the kind of security, not just around technology, that the South Koreans, for example, need to look at. So how are, how are threats evolving over time? Well, I think you know, one of the most important things to say is that the the potential impact of these threats is much more profound than ever before. So back in the day, you know, in, the, in the mid, late 80s, early 90s, PC viruses and spam were the primary issues. And sure, you know, they caused problems, but the impact was nothing like uh, what it is potentially today and is started, we're starting to see today. Then we move to internet viruses, DDoS attacks, you know, which could bring down commercial sites, government sites and so on. Worms, Trojans, phishing bots and so on. Today we're seeing a move towards, I guess, you know, some, some, some things that have been around for a while, but we're seeing a lot more, for example, of maladvertising going on as advertising becomes a bigger way for certain social media organizations, for example, to generate revenues. Legally, getting onto a site with an advertisement with malware in it is becoming a more and more attractive approach. Admittedly, it's been around for a while, but it's something we're starting to see a lot more of today. Uh, ransomware as well. So sites flashing up with an FBI warning saying that you have illegal content in your machine, pay $200 and we'll clear it up for you, or you just can't get into your machine, is again something that's becoming commonplace. And organizations that are doing this are making millions of dollars from it. I mean, a lot of people see it coming and find a way around it, but still plenty of people will shell out that $200 and sometimes it doesn't get them out of the situation they found themselves in. Social media, uh, and mobile cloud APTs, so-called watering holes, are becoming more and more attractive approaches. So just touching a little bit on social media, you know, we're seeing a lot of, in social media, I'm sure you've seen it yourself, a lot of people that use Twitter get direct messages coming to them saying things like, look at what people have been saying about you, click on this. And that gives an opportunity to offload 
an unattractive payload onto your particular uh, device that you're using. So similarly, uh, you know, we're seeing so-called more and more so-called watering holes tied in with targeted attacks. So watering holes are typically, you know, sites with vulnerabilities that are that are used as a way of pouncing or offloading your toxic payload onto people passing through, so-called drive-bys, I love the analogies. But they're becoming more and more, it's compromising no, not such secure websites, typically. But we're seeing a move towards increasingly targeted attacks, where customized, customized malware has been developed with a view to attacking specific organizations or individuals. And over time, information about those organizations and individuals is collected and then offloaded using uh, a crafted vehicle, let's say, to do that. But this very focused way of doing things is becoming more common. You know, an organization could, for example, get information about any individual in this room and they could find out a little from prof so perhaps your social media profiles, they could find out a little bit about what school you went to, they could find some connections, they could arrange to send an email from an old school friend, for example, that might say something like, we found this photograph of you, you know, from when you were 10 years old, click here to see it, for example. And a lot of people might fall for that. Those are the kinds of targeted attacks that we're increasingly seeing uh, on individuals. But we're moving to a situation where, we're t where people are talking about cyber everything in the security world. Cyber terrorism, cyber esp espionage, for example, are things that we're increasingly talking about, which reflects the increasing impact of security breaches on the physical world. So just to get down to some of the specifics, uh, what I'm trying to do here, I won't dwell on this slide for too long, but really what I want to highlight is the fact that the, fast, the highest growth that we're seeing in security is around mobile, so mobile security and virtualization security. So these are the big growth areas in the security markets uh, today, which reflect the way organizations are starting to move, which is towards more highly virtualized environments or cloud-oriented environments and increasingly using mobile devices to access resources. Social media, which I talked about a little bit, is now becoming a key part of the customer experience. Perhaps more dangerously from a security perspective, it's becoming a more key part of the enterprise experience. So companies are increasingly starting to use social media as a way of engaging with their customers, both from a B2B perspective and a B2C perspective. So we're seeing uh, this, this increasing move in that direction, which is making social media a very attractive platform for malware. Because again, there's always a lag in the security industry and catching up to these new platforms. Or actually, perhaps I shouldn't say in the security industry. From a buyer perspective, there's always a lag in being aware of it. Usually within the security industry, the firms that provide the security software are fully aware of these threats. But it usually takes some time for the organizations and the individuals that are threatened to respond accordingly. But social is the big one. So again, you know, we talked a little bit about the, 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 uh, you know, the Obama impact, but that was more of an example of the virtual impacting the physical world. But just the kinds of things that are happening. So in Twitter, you know, I mentioned you might get these direct messages saying, look at what people have been saying about you. Also offers, which can look very, very attractive that you might click on. You might also share those offers, those promotions with friends. And of course, usually there's no particular promotion or offer at the end of it, but it's very convincing what's put forward. Another very famous one was the dislike button, add-ons to social media uh, that you can integrate. So the dislike button uh, for Facebook was an attractive add-on that you could potentially put into Facebook. And there was no reason for you know, a less aware person to think that this would be malware for one reason. It was... I wouldn't say perfectly targeted, but targeted at a certain audience that was looking uh, you know, for this type of additional functionality, which again was just a vehicle uh, for malware. So it's becoming the most attractive platform 
uh, you know, as mobile devices become the most attractive hardware. And young people are often very susceptible to social media scams because they're often less cautious about sharing personal information than others. And spam and phishing are pretty much shifting wholesale to social media platforms. So again, just to give you some, some data, you know, we've talked about the shift to cloud computing. So security is still widely perceived to be the biggest threat uh, when it comes to moving to cloud services generally. So it's still something that people are most concerned about. I mean, our argument is that provided you get your security posture right, it shouldn't be. I mean, there are still massive concerns around it, but it's still something that's manageable. There are, there are pros and cons. Obviously, all your eggs are in one basket to a greater extent. And if somebody comes up with a sophisticated targeted attack, your cloud infrastructure or the public cloud service provider uh, is highly vulnerable. But on the other hand, if everything is in the cloud and people are accessing it using mobile devices, you can use security software to restrict the amount of data that gets onto these endpoints. So there are ways in which these security concerns can be addressed. With traditional distributed computing, it's much more difficult to manage the data that gets onto the endpoints. So we don't know too much about what sits on the laptops of all of our employees all the time, for example. Somebody could mislay the laptop and compromise the organization significantly in doing that, and this obviously happens a lot. Uh, somebody could put a, uh, you know, a, a memory stick into a USB port on a laptop and compromise an entire network in the traditional distributed environment. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not that the security threat is necessarily greater than the distributed environment, it's just the things to consider are changing. And I think that's the mindset that organisa organisations need to have as they move into cloud, they just need to make sure that their security stance moves with that rather than allowing security to frighten them from moving more and more into cloud-oriented environments. So just from a mobile security perspective, again, some of the numbers that we have, it's still a relatively, a relatively small market, uh, but it's one that's growing very rapidly. And considering the vulnerability of the Android ecosystem, it's quite incredible uh, you know, how small this market continues to be. I mean, to us, it suggests that not a huge amount of organizations are yet supporting Android from a BYOD perspective. In fact, I'd just like to quickly ask everybody, could those of you who have BYOD policies in place in your companies please raise your hands? Okay, so not a huge number. Uh, can those of you who support Android please raise your hands? Okay, so, okay, a few. That's always very interesting data for us. So to us, Android is a mecca for malware at the moment. The operating system is highly fragmented. Updates are not been pushed aggressively in the same way as they are in some other ecosystems. Google control, the Google-controlled Nexus 4 is much more secure as Google does take some responsibility for this. But the carriers that handle other flavors of Android are not ensuring that updates and patches are getting onto devices on time. So right now there's massive vulnerability in the Android ecosystem. So it's, there's very exposed source code on what is becoming the dominant mobile platform. And the source of the malware is often apps. So there are so many fake apps out there from the Android stores that you can download. There are fake Instagrams, there are fake Angry Birds, and so on. And one of the most common attacks that some of you in this room may have experienced or be aware of is sending messages to premium rate SMS services once you download this toxic malware onto your device. So this is becoming one of the most common approaches along with a variety uh, of other ways of attacking. And the Linux-based code within Android is familiar territory to many hackers, which makes it so attractive. And the question that we have is what is going to be the response 
of the carriers and Google to this huge threat that hasn't really been addressed to any significant degree yet. So in conclusion, IT security is now having a very profound effect on the physical world today. So I think the best example is really just, just that simple bit of hacking into the AP Twitter account and the effect that had on financial markets instantly. So an AP tweet saying that Barack Obama is injured as a result of a couple of bombs going off in the White House had a huge impact. Embedded IT is massively increasing the potential impact of these security threats and of course the malware and by embedded IT we mean IP enabled devices in things like utility infrastructures, automotives, retail outlets and so on. So IPv6 is allowing us to have an infinite number of IP addresses. Cloud, mobile, and security together are driving the new security threats that we're finding. And cyber espionage and cyber sabotage are becoming a reality. In fact, it's wrong of me to say they're becoming a reality. They are a reality. We have plenty of examples already. And there are more and more state-sponsored cyber attacks. Admittedly, it's becoming increasingly difficult to attribute attacks to specific organizations uh, or states. This is one of the, the major challenges that organizations and governments are facing today. And just, you know, one of the comments made by the US Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, recently, was he stated that just as nuclear was the strategic warfare of the industrial era, cyber warfare has become the strategic warfare of the information era. So on that note, uh, what I've tried to do is really set the stage for some of the presentations that you'll see uh, later on today. Uh, so I hope that you, you found that uh, useful to start off with. So thank you very much. <laughs>